Professor Tsai is a professor of law at American University in Washington, D.C., a prize-winning essayist in constitutional law and history. Professor Tsai was born in Taiwan, but grew up in our very own Port Townsend. We're so lucky. He earned his B.A. Magna Cum Laude in History and Political Science from UCLA, where he was a Phi Beta Kappa. And after graduating from Yale Law School, he was a law clerk for federal judges in New York and Boston. He then became a civil rights lawyer in Georgia. But his first teaching position was at the University of Oregon Law School. He then joined the law faculty at American University in 2008 and became a full professor the following year. Practical Equality, Forging Justice in a Divided Nation, so needed, is his third book. This is a call to arms to do the hard work of equality and how we can make social progress in tough times. Really want to thank everybody uh, for coming here and spending your evening with us. Um, I also really want to thank Robert uh, for writing this book, um, this big provocative book, um, and for being back here in Seattle again and joining us in this conversation. Um, so I guess, well, should we just jump right into this? Okay, all right. <laughs> All right, uh, so uh, very early on, uh, Sai raises the important question, what is to be done to confront injustice when the timing doesn't seem right or the odds appear stacked against you? Um, and he presents a, a kind of an interesting proposal for our time, and that is practical equality. Um, and so I was wondering if you could discuss a bit about what you mean by this and also how you differentiate that from two other words in your title, justice um, and equality? Those are great questions, tough questions. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll see what I can do. First of all, I want to thank everybody for coming here. There are uh, a lot of wonderful things to be doing uh, on a great evening like this. And um, I'm, I'm happy that you all decided to come and spend a few minutes with us. Um, thank you, too, to the University of Washington Bookstore for hosting us. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to, to come here. My, my father. Uh, uh, came to the United States from from Taiwan, and he was um, he was a judge there and tried to uh, sort of reconnect with that profession once uh, my family moved here. But it became too difficult to do, and so one of the things he tried to do was to was to um, uh, become a lawyer by attending University of Washington. But it didn't quite work mm -hmm. out for him. So it actually is particularly poignant for me to to be here and uh, and and to be in this in this place. So. Uh, so uh, practical quality. Yes. Uh, what makes it practical? Uh, what's, what's the idea here? Uh, I use the term practical equality to try to distinguish equality as a kind of ideal mm -hmm. notion. And, and because that's often the way we, we tend to think about it, uh, as um, a concept that we see in the Declaration of Independence, that we see in the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. And if you ask anybody on the street, on that ideal level, people will always agree. Of course, of course, we believe in equality, right? Oh, right. <laughs> um, but then it turns out that mm -hmm. the moment we start to have concrete discussions mm -hmm. about factual situations, whether it's same-sex marriage, whether it is um, uh, whether African American uh, school children can attend the same school, schools as white children, um, and and the list is quite long. Right. Once we start to have those concrete questions, then we see the um, the agreement start to fracture and start to disappear. And so the first part of the book, I try to ask this question of why why is it so hard to do the work of equality in real life? And 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 some of the answers that I come up with uh, have to do with um, not so much co like conceptual disagreement to sell often like lawyers and um, to some extent political theorists think yes. about it, right? That if we could just come up with the, the most like co co coherent idea of equality, then we can convince everybody to kind of come to our side. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's how you win people over. But I think that that's not really the way life works. That, mm -hmm. that you know, the more that I studied the actual struggles that people have. It's, it, you know, equality has always been something that you had to uh, take for yourselves, right? That, that groups had to reach out and take um, as an idea. Uh, and it's not always been easy. Um, and 
it's always been about overcoming a series of struggles. And so um, the reason why I use the, the, the phrase practical quality is to highlight uh, just how difficult that work is. And if it is that difficult, right. then we ought to have um, as big a toolkit as we can have at our disposal as activists, mm -hmm. as citizens, mm -hmm. as lawyers. Um, and you know, sometimes what we want is we want the, the big stick, right? The, the big sledgehammer, which is the rhetoric of equality, right? You know, these people deserve to be treated equally, just like anybody else. And that's a very powerful argument. But sometimes that argument's not going to work. Uh, and when it doesn't work, then we sometimes need other kinds of tools to, to help us. And that's the sort of second half of the book, is what are the other kinds of tools that we can use to sort of um, reduce some of the burdens that certain uh, populations face, whether you're a sexual minority, whether you're a racial minority, mm -hmm. uh, or ha what have you. So I was wondering in terms of if you could speak about how you personally became interested in this book. So one of the, I'm always interested in kind of what's the background about around why one writes an article and why one writes the book. And I was wondering, I, I had heard, I don't know, maybe it was from a conversation or maybe I saw somewhere online that you actually spent a bit of time in the South um, as well. And so I, I, I've, I don't know if this was kind of the culmination of many years of, of thinking about the, this equality, but if you could speak a bit about kind of how did we get to this. Yeah, so I think my experience as an activist and as a lawyer in, in the South um, has certainly shaped my, my thinking about equality, that mm -hmm. you, know, you, you fight one battle, you think that's done, and then the next thing you know, you have to fight the same battle again. And in, in, in a way, Interesting. that sort of attitude, um, mm -hmm. I try to carry over into the book. Um, but I, th I think the more specific motivation for me to write this book has to do with, with uh, the election of President Trump, that, that there was a sense of urgency for me, uh, in particular, with his election, that there were alarming things that that he had said during the campaign um, about Hispanic people, about uh, about Muslim people, and then he became elected. So it was quite clear that at some point there were there were going to be some pretty interesting and probably some very harsh policies mm -hmm. that were going to be implemented. Right. Uh, and and I thought that that more than ever we needed to start thinking about uh, you know which populations might be uh, disproportionately affected specifically targeted, uh, and, um, and that really kicked me into action. And so in the, in the beginning of the book, I, I plop readers <laughs> right into that weekend, <laughs> yeah. um, just kind of right off the bat, um, the weekend where um, the, the travel ban was implemented. And if, and if you remember, it was a crazy weekend. It was a Friday, and, um, and there wasn't really any announcement, I don't think. Suddenly, mm -hmm. people were just being yanked off of planes, mm -hmm. stopped on tarmacs. Um, there were, there were uh, b babies, young children, who were going to come to the United States for medical care, couldn't get the medical care. Uh, there were people rerouted and stranded in another country. Mm -hmm. So um, I plop readers into that weekend um, in part because I want people right away to feel the sense of, um, of injury, right? That, that there's a population that's experiencing something different from every other traveler that we can think of. And there's a way in which we can kind of talk about things in the abstract where we don't sense the, the sense of dislocation, the sense of disproportionate treatment, mm -hmm. the sense of economic loss and opportunities, right? And so I wanted people to feel that right away, and that mm -hmm. dropped. But the, other, the, but the positive side of that weekend was the activism that happened. It was almost spontaneous, yeah. where you had law students, you had regular citizens volunteering their time, mm -hmm. kind of descending on the airports around the country, um, demanding answers. Right. I mean, you literally had um, Homeland Security employees like hiding from uh, public officials and, <laughs> and, and citizens. I don't remember yeah. this. Because um, they didn't really know what to say. And for a while there, they thought that um, the permanent residents, green card holders, mm -hmm. were also going to be affected yeah. by the ban. And, and so you actually had government officials just sort of running around, not sure. What. So, um, so the travel ban figures prominently in the, in the book. It, uh, it's where I start. And I, and I come back to talk about how that, um, the course of that case kind of um, uh, winds its way through the, through the courts. And for me, that, that case really offers a really interesting lesson because a lot of people really focused on that case as an example of, of religious discrimination. Mm. That, that, you know, here was a president who talked very much in these sort of ethno-nationalist terms. He promised to shut down all Muslim entry. Then he rolls out the ban. Right? A lot of average people saw it that way. I know. I confess I saw it that way as well. But then quickly as it 
the, the, the ban started going through the courts, we saw that certain people in power had trouble seeing it exactly the same way many of us were seeing that case. And, um, and it became clear to me that they were going to struggle with finding that to be a violation of equality. And so I talk a little bit about why that's the case, why courts, why judges um, ha have so much trouble seeing what other people sometimes obviously see as an e equality problem. One of the cool things that does come out of the case is that even though the judges have trouble kind of doing the work of equality explicitly there, they do find that the travel ban um, has problems with it. And they end up using the idea of fairness, which is similar, uh -huh. but, but, but um, not exactly the same. Right. And so what they basically say is, what, in a sense, you know, they sense they have trouble treating um, foreign nationals the same as US citizens, which is a concern that a lot of people have. Um, and instead, they say, well, look, you know, Travelers have certain kinds of expectations about being treated fairly. And we can at least say that this group was treated unfairly. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that there needed to be procedures in place mm -hmm. that did that, but, but we don't see them. And so um, uh, they need some kind of relief. So, so uh, for me, that's an example of finding a way around a particular obstacle. Um, and as a result, the, the administration has to change the policy uh, twice, right? So right. by the time the Supreme Court gets it, it's a very different policy than what it was originally. Right. So Warren, since I was speaking about this case in terms of the, kind of the earlier manifestation before it hits the Supreme Court, we're here in Seattle, and I was so pleased right. to see you spend um, a number of pages talking about Washington v. Trump, right? Um, and so especially in terms of, I, I want to kind of go now into um, I enjoyed, this is obviously, by the way, please go get this book. I actually don't highlight every book that I get, um, but there's just so much in this book. Also, this is a quick plug. Um, I grappled with this book. I initially came, you don't know this, I initially came to this book and I was like, I don't know. We got to go for it all. Right, but like, but but there's a number of kind of second. And I was and I and I struggled and I wrestled with so many concepts in this book. We can talk about this later. Um, but there is so, but the the chapter that really spoke to me um, in so many ways is is what you just discussed about fair play, um, and this fairness argument. And I think I was won over pretty quickly for me um, in that chapter. Uh, so I was wondering if, if you could talk a bit about this fairness argument, um, and especially in context of Washington uh, v. Trump and, um, and, and the fairness argument here, and why I, I, I think the argument around fairness, fair play, and thinking about that case really hit home to me. Yeah, so I'm hearing this for the first time, so, so thank you. <laughs> uh, it, 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 Megan saw the saw the manuscript in early form, and, and I got lots of really tough questions, and I, I still remember this. It ma made the book much better. Um, so, one of the obstacles that that we we tend to um, see happen over and over when people demand to be treated equally uh, is that um, people in positions of authority sometimes worry that uh, it would require doing a lot in order to treat something, mm -hmm. someone equally. And um, they worry that they might have to, you know, that in order to treat someone equally, they might end up doing something that will change the entire character of an institution. So, for example, in the famous case of uh, VMI, which was a military school in mm -hmm. Virginia, uh, and, was, and for years was all male. And then you had a challenge under the Equal Protection Clause, right, that, that this was no longer right or constitutional, that women really ought to have the opportunity to attend this school and uh, enjoy its resources. Okay. And um, you know, when I read the briefs and the arguments were over and over by, from multiple sources, right, that, that, that they were really worried that, uh, and they wanted the court to worry as well, that um, if they let women into the institution, it would totally destroy the unique character of the institute. You might as well just hang up a sign that said, you know, VMI is now closed. I mean, right. this is, a, and some of it's a little over the top. Right, but there is something to it, mm -hmm. right? That, that an institution that had not had a certain kind of experience would have to change to some degree, and there's uncertainty about how it would have to change mm -hmm. to accommodate uh, a group that had previously been excluded. And we see this concern over and over. Same thing with marriage, right? That if we allow same-sex couples to access the benefits and the symbolism of marriage, that somehow this would destroy marriage for opposite-sex couples. And and you saw. So we see this over and over. 
Um, with, the, with the travel ban context, I think that there are a number of things that really start to hang people up. One is, if you, uh, if you say that the equality idea is violated here, you might be, and I alluded to this before a second ago, you might be treating um, or promising to treat migrants or foreign nationals like US citizens. Mm. And you, know, you can imagine the justices having some qualms about that. Right? People who might not have an attachment to the United States suddenly being able to invoke all kinds of rights that they had not previously recognized. And so this is, I think, one major obstacle. But the other one is this. You have a president who was just elected. And it's true that um, there are a lot of people who don't exactly like him and don't agree with his policies. But if you say that this policy is a violation of equality, aren't you also saying that he is a religious bigot? All right, now, it might be true that a lot of people think that. But it might be different for the Supreme Court of the United States to say the president is, in fact, a religious bigot on a signature issue. Like, this is a big thing for him. And so I think that those two things really start to hang up the courts. Now, the fairness idea doesn't require either of those two things, right? It doesn't require um, the court or any judge to say, you are, you are a bigot. Uh, you have violated someone's mm. rights in this deep moral way. Mm. Um, uh, it also allows certain kinds of remedies um, that are not as, um, as extreme, as, as, as portentous. And um, I, we talked a little bit about that a second ago. Like that, so if the problem with the travel ban is fairness, then there are certain kinds of things that the administration can do to tweak it to make it more fair. What's your sense about when people should make fairness claims as opposed to equality claims? Yeah. Like, is there, is there a, a, a calculus? I, I know there's not an exact calculus, right? That's the political scientist in me. But like, is there a sense of when that if you are one of these activist attorneys, or maybe just an attorney, or somebody, a student in this room who is trying to figure out, in a situation right now, trying to figure out how to make a claim against the university, is there a sense about like when sh one should pursue fairness right. or? Right, so this is a good question. So these are all sort of strategic decisions we have yeah. to make, right? And you right. sort of have to read your audience uh -huh. and you have to read <laughs> whether there's an ob <laughs> obstacle that is sort of yeah. arising. And, and I think it's gonna be a little bit different depending on um, the situation. I mean, with the, with the travel ban, you had um, some real obstacles that we've seen historically. For example, challenging the president's action has historically always been difficult. Mm -hmm. And courts have always had trouble second guessing presidents. And so that should have been a warning sign itself. Um, you know, the other thing is national security. When, hmm. when someone says national security, courts have tended to sort of roll over. And so both of these <laughs> things together, right, um, I think were red flags. Mm -hmm. Now, um, here's what I would say. Sometimes activists, and maybe this was a source of some of your worry, is like, you know, you don't want to move to a second best argument or even a third best argument if you don't think it's going to give you what you want, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes the equality argument is going to be the, it's going to give you most of what you need. So if you are a group that has been completely excluded from an institution, mm -hmm. then the equality argument is your best access to that institution, so, right? So yeah. a marriage, for example, right? right? The fairness argument isn't always going to get you there right. in the way that they that that uh, same-sex couples wanted access to that right. institution. Now, before we got to the point where judges were more comfortable dealing with um, the rights of sexual minorities, um, fairness arguments did do some work. So dealing with the rights. Uh, that that, that uh, gay parents had with respect to children. Mm -hmm. um, there are places there where fairness arguments were able to do some of that work, even as judges had difficult, you know, sort of working mm -hmm. through their issues, right? Um, <laughs> having, you know, trying to understand sexuality and so mm -hmm. forth. Yeah. So. So a question also here in terms of I I I, I had not known that one of the one of the one of the aspects that kind of promoting of it well reasons why behind you writing this book was actually um, the election. Uh, I, so I was in New York. Um, I arrived in New York the morning after the van. And so JFK was a mess. And I was meeting with uh, two of my cl very close friends um, who are national security attorneys, det attorneys for detainees, both of which actually are Muslim Americans. Um, and so it was just mayhem in New York. And I had just come to New York 
to hang out with them to catch up, and that actually didn't happen. Um, and so I saw JFK, everybody there, and I left out um, that Sunday, so it was just, right, attorneys just camped out. But my question is, right, so a lot of the book really focuses on courts and legal claims, and I know you alluded to it a little bit earlier, but I was wondering if you could say um, a bit about the role of the public mm -hmm. um, outside and inside of legal institutions and kind of sowing the ground that helps justices decide cases in a particular way. Sure. Um, and so the, the two cases that jumped out to me in your book were one, Brown v. Mississippi, uh -huh. um, as well as um, the, obviously Washington v. Trump and Brown v. Mississippi in particular because I do work around racial violence, right, and I'm aware of some of the groups that were working to raise the attention about lynching and mob violence. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could say a bit about kind of the role of individuals um, as well. Absolutely. So. Um, a lot, a lot of the stories I tell are stories of, of legal disputes, things that ended up in courts, and um, there's sort of, sort of uh, areas where, where I'm, I'm most comfortable, but also because um, they illustrate uh, another idea that I, I, I want people to, to hopefully think about, which is that justice is a sort of collaborative endeavor. It mm -hmm. requires, mm -hmm. you always got to get somebody on your side um, who might be not, might not be originally sympathetic to your position. It doesn't mean you have to convince 85% of the public. You right? Because this idea of struggle requires only that you get just enough people to see the see you know see that there is a harm here that needs to be addressed right away. Um, but but there are examples in the book that are meant to illustrate that uh, everyday people have some power as well as some obligation to think about mm -hmm. how to, to do equality in a variety of different ways. And one of my, one of my examples um, has to do with the, with the issue of slavery. And mm -hmm. that is that the, this country ha, um, had a multi-generational conversation over the question of slavery and to what extent slavery was a, a, a moral stain on this, on this country's conscience, right? Mm -hmm. And that took a war to finally solve. And, and, and so even as that moral debate is going on, it's a very important one, people weren't waiting for that moral question to be solved. They were taking um, matters into their own hands, right? right? right. You had enslaved people themselves yeah. actually going to court and they were making, they were repurposing um, you know, Western legal concepts that had been used to hold them down. Um, notions of assault and battery, um, they were trying to flip them around, right? Mm -hmm. And co-opt them and, and argue, actually invite, right. judges who might be sympathetic to them to kind of repurpose those arguments and say that, that they were being unlawfully imprisoned by their mm -hmm. masters. And occasionally they would actually get a judge to agree with them and order them to be released. I also use the example of the Underground Railroad as no, okay. because that was described at the time uh, by some as a form of practical abolition. Mm -hmm. right? It was like, okay, <laughs> people are having this big moral conversation. We're not sure how long this is going to take, but even as we wait for this to happen, um, we can ferry people across and um, get them in a place where they can um, find a way to sort of reach their potential and really, really show that the, that the, that the lies that the slaveholders were telling weren't, you know, they just weren't true about uh, the capacity of enslaved people to be full citizens, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that was some of the incremental work that others were doing. Now, you mentioned Brown versus Mississippi. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a terrible case. This terrible. Is a terrible case. Uh, it comes out of the, uh, of, the, of the Jim Crow South mm -hmm. in the 1930s. And you might even think about it as uh, the Forgotten Brown case, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it comes at a time well before the civil rights movement uh -huh. um, is, is like a truly national phenomenon uh -huh. that it raises everybody's awareness and, and, and consciousness over racial equality. And what happens is a white planter is found murdered in his home and immediately the suspicion um, falls on a number of African American males who are living in the area and a sheriff and his deputies um, go grab um, a number of these suspects and they, um, they try to get um, uh, confessions out of them. And Brown himself is uh, strung up a tree by a mob mm -hmm. and they simulate a lynching mm -hmm. and they say, confess, we know you did it. And he mm -hmm. keeps saying, no, 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 I didn't do it, I'm innocent. And they don't believe him and so they let him down. And then they string him back up again mm -hmm. and he won't confess, which is remarkable. Um, the other suspects, uh, they take them down to the station, they strip them naked yeah. and they beat them until they, uh, they say incriminating things. 
Um, Brown is picked up the next day, and he's then beaten until he confesses. So all of these uh, suspects are then uh, tried, and the witnesses are the uh, members of the um, the posse or the yeah. sheriff's deputies who heard the confessions, and they and they're all convicted and given um, the death penalty. And so. When this case goes up to the Mississippi Supreme Court, the Mississippi Supreme Court says, we see no injustice here. <laughs> they say, as far as we're concerned, um, the trial went perfectly. Yeah. All the trial rules were observed. Um, he had a lawyer and had a chance to um, question the witnesses. And there was no bias on the part of the judge who handled the case. And so the death penalty stands. Um, remarkable. The case then eventually goes up to the Supreme Court of the United States. And there, I think, this is where the real conundrum is, right? They sense very powerfully that there's a racial injustice here. And by then, the NAACP is involved. Yeah. And they're, they're, yeah. you know, they're making, a, making a huge think about this. And they're pointing to this case as another example of, of uh, injustice right. in yeah. uh, the Jim Crow South. Mm -hmm. And they very much talk about this as uh, inequality in mm -hmm. the criminal justice system, which it is. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that the justices up until this point have not developed the idea of equality enough in the criminal context to feel comfortable enough to use it. Um, the only other time they really ever used the idea of equality in a criminal case had to do when uh, West Virginia systematically excluded all African American males from jury service. But what they said in that case was because jury service was so important to this notion of citizenship, well, then people couldn't be excluded in this way. Well, now, this case, though, presented a very different animal because if they started to stick the idea of equality into the criminal justice system, what they would really be saying is that the idea of equality should come in and constrain the way that police or uh, sheriffs do their jobs. Uh, because we're talking about the behavior of people who collected the evidence in this right. case. And this would have been a major leap for the Supreme Court in, in 1930s um, America. So what do they do? Uh, interestingly enough, they didn't give up. And so I actually think that this is a good example that they sensed that there was racial inequality. And then they just found another way to kind of um, deal with the problem. And they found the idea of fairness to work pretty well. And instead of saying, and, and, and again here, this is, they're not focusing attention on the sheriffs, although what they did was uh -huh. worth moral a condemnation, right? I mean, I think so. Right. But they didn't do that. What they did was they condemned the process. And they said that this process was fundamentally unfair. And so for a judge not to come step in and kind of intervene um, on behalf of these suspects, yeah. cast the entire process into disrepute. Um, and that was the way they handled the case. So an another question here moving um, about Matt, um, kind of staying a little bit on the criminal justice system, the last question about the criminal just criminal legal system. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping that you can say a little bit more about the anti-cruelty uh, argument. I think I found this really interesting, especially as it relates to mass incarceration. Um, so if you'll indulge me, can I read two sentences from your book? OK, so um, on the same page, um, Cy writes, Whereas equality discourse obsesses over the intent lying behind one's actions, the anti-cruelty debate trains attention on the objective nature of a practice. Is it punitive in form and function? And its relative place among possible punishment practices. Moving down, moving down. Like the fair play strategy, the question is not so much whether certain kinds of people deserve full equality, but instead, what a particular sanction says about a community. Because it de-emphasizes who deserves a particular right, this approach gives individuals marginalized for good reasons an opportunity to avoid inhumane and selective treatment. And I, I found this interesting. Yeah, so this, this actually was a surprise to me as well that, um, <laughs> you know, one of, the, one of the questions that activists and lawyers um, have to ask themselves is, um, what are the trade-offs? Like, if I make this kind of an argument, what do I gain? from it, and what might I lose? And these are hard, these are hard decisions to make. Um, and what I noticed was that sometimes if you make a fairness argument or you make an argument about um, cruelty, that um, sometimes, uh, because of the way that the, that conversation tends to happen, that um, people are sometimes more willing to uh, look at systematic abuses. Mm -hmm. Um, and where they weren't otherwise willing to look at it under the equality framework. Mm -hmm. um, and the equality discourse 
tends to require us to focus on individual perpetrators um, as well as sometimes to, to call them out, right? If someone has acted in a racially discriminatory way, we need to know who those people are. And this has actually become a problem in the criminal uh -huh. justice system because there's this very famous case involving the death penalty where uh, 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 an African-American man uh, challenged the, the use of capital punishment in Georgia and had the most sophisticated study to date at that time, which showed, in fact, that the death penalty was being administered in a racially disproportionate way. And the justices, um, they had no trouble. They didn't find anything wrong with the study. They couldn't find anything wrong with the study. They just found a way to find it irrelevant. And the reason why they did that was because they, they had trouble figuring out who was the perpetrator in this system. And they needed, they needed to, they fixated on this. They needed to find who in this complicated system was the one who was morally responsible for the racial discrimination. And since nobody could identify exactly who was the racist here, they said, I'm sorry, we're just not going to give you any kind of a remedy. And they were willing to tolerate um, the systematic discrimination or at least the disproportionate impact of the, of the death penalty there. So the interesting thing is that when we shift the conversation, sometimes you see people more willing to deal with system, syst systematic injuries. And I think that's true with the anti-cruelty anti idea. Mm. We've got lots of interesting examples where uh, someone raises that concern, and then um, what happens is someone's willing to say, hey, you know, I, I'm bothered by the way a particular kind of punishment um, is meted out, and I don't really care, uh, in a way, what the consequences are. You know, the, it, the, the, the fact that we have a form of punishment says something about us. So one of the cases I talk about is a challenge to, I think it was Alabama's use of the hitching post. Yeah. And um, uh, this was only done in, in prisons, but it was, a, it was a fairly harsh sort of punishment. But it turns out it wasn't even just used to punish inmates. Sometimes the guards would just get annoyed with somebody, like someone was supposed to be in a work crew, the guy didn't bring the right boots, and so then they tied this guy to the hitching post for like 18 hours until he soiled himself, and he, you know, and, he, and they didn't let him have anything to eat or drink. And the, the court is asked to think about the nature of this punishment and this measure, and they really didn't worry about any particular guard's mindset, what they were up to. They also didn't get tripped up on this question of, whether uh, treating the prisoner's claim here seriously mm -hmm. meant that somehow we were treating an inmate like you know, the equivalent of a full citizen. Right? Yeah. This is one of the problems with prisoners' rights is we, we, it's an area where equality ideas tend not to have the same kind of power. Right. Um, because what we tend to say is, is that when someone has committed a crime, particularly mm -hmm. a serious one, then we're treating them differently not because of who they are, because of what they've, what they've done. So, but in this hitching post case, the, the, the justices really do a good job, I think, of uh, focusing on the nature of the harms and how the, 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 the prison is using it to kind of, and actually one of the things that comes out during litigation is when they're asked, like, hey, why do you need to do this anyway? What they say is, well, we need some sort of instrument to, to force people to work the inmates to work. And so you suddenly get all this rich history uh, in Alabama of using inmates to sort of work against their will. And, and this goes, of course, way back. And, um, and so, 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 so this is a system where the, the, the hitching post is part of a kind of indentured servitude almost, mm -hmm. right? And the court is OK with saying, you know what, this is the end of this right. uh, as far as we're concerned. All right, so moving out of the criminal justice system into something that most of my students care a lot about because we are on a college campus, speech. Um, so uh, I was wondering if you could say a bit about speech rights. Can they promote equality? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes <laughs> they can. Yeah, okay, sometimes all right. they can. Talk to not, me. not always. Yeah, okay. Not always. You know, <laughs> you know I, I think there are challenges, and in the book I really do try to uh, grapple with them right. seriously, right? So the, yeah. I think the biggest challenge is hate speech. Uh, uh, what happened in Charlottesville, mm -hmm. um, the challenge of white nationalism. Mm -hmm. um, white nationalists have a, a very scary and dangerous agenda, um, and yet they're insisting on, on their right to express themselves, just like every other American. And this is a real challenge for mm -hmm. us, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and I try to confront how serious this is. But one of the things I say with respect to really disfavored speakers, including potentially dangerous speakers, is we do have a lot of tools available at our disposal 
um, in, including universities, have at their disposal to try to safeguard uh, other people's rights, even as someone who is spouting this um, craziness, right, um, is allowed to speak. And, and, and I guess what I say about this is that it's worth trying to preserve that ability, because at least throughout our history, um, the, the right to free speech has tended to be very, very important uh, to social activists. Um, that uh, when we go back far enough, we see that socialists needed to vindicate their rights mm -hmm. to, to free speech. That, the, the, that one of the most powerful ways to shut down the moral debate over slavery was actually to prohibit abolitionist speech. And so, um, you know, people who believed in, 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 in freedom and liberty and equality in those days saw very keenly, keenly they needed to worry about free speech at the same time they worried about equality. And they saw those two things as, 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 as interconnected. So that would be my example there. Great. Okay, so bef I, don't want, I want to make sure that we have time for Q&A. Um, so if you have a question um, for, for Professor Sai, can you please raise your hand about his work? In the meantime, while you think about them, I will pose one last question to you, which is what do you want your um, readers to take away from this? Um, and if I can, I'll put readers in three different groups, um, the larger public, students, and academics. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Three, we'll three different groups. <laughs> um, and if you have a question, by the way, just raise your hand. And so then, because he doesn't need to answer my full question. <laughs> Let's start with it's students. Okay. Um, I think for students, um, learning the history of the, of the struggles yeah. over equality, I think, is, 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 is very important. And surprising, the kind of things that we learn about what worked and what didn't work, yeah. as well as the same kind of obstacles that we sort of over and over. Because I think learning that history allows us to be uh, able to make those strategic decisions more wisely. Right? Mm -hmm. We can, um, this book is intended to be an optimistic book, so, so I try as much as possible to try to extract like the, like the good stories out yeah. of the god-awful <laughs> things that people had to go through, right? And that here, this is an awful situation, but someone was able to, 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 to find justice um, as long as they weren't so um, focused on only one way of, of trying to get there. That, that being flexible, and here's where we come to do, you know, what act activists can learn, is that we can be flexible about the different kinds of tools that we might use so that when, when we're dealing with people and they're not sympathetic, we can see if there's another tool that might be you know, able to get the job done. Um, academics, um, academics are a tougher crowd um, <laughs> in, in general, um, you can see. Um, you know, I, I think that what I hope academics um, can take away from this is just that we can, we can marry different um, disciplines and maybe get something synthetic and useful. So there's a little bit of history here, of course. Right. There's a little bit of, of legal theory and, and thinking about legal ideas and arguments. Um, and there's also um, s some stuff about politics, right? There's, there's a lot of stuff here that hopefully will be familiar to people who, who, who study politics every day. And um, you know, hopefully they'll agree with something in there. Yeah, question in the back. Thank you for visiting us and for this beautifully written book um, that's so important for our times. Um, I'm just curious in these divided times, um, you know, equality itself is a very partisan value. You know, people have done worldview studies and like, you know, like we keep, and there's this whole like theory where like conserv people who are conservative tend to be hierarchical, egalitarians, like value equality, like people just value different ideas differently. And so even the idea of quality is already a very partisan thing. And then like one of the challenges of our times is like achieving progress while finding neutral principles that knit people together. You name one, like, hey, before you like deprive someone of, of their property, life, or liberty, give them some process. Seems a little more neutral than like this is unequal, you know, and 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 so forth. What are some other more neutral values that might stitch us together in these times that don't seem as partisan as equality? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so I would just pose it a little bit differently, though. I, I don't think it's necessarily about finding something neutral. I, just, I think it's about finding something that will work. Um, I, don't, I don't think ideas of fairness are neutral or, or anti-cruelty ideas are neutral, but they are different. Like the structure, like if you're going to have that conversation about whether something is cruel and whether it says something as, uh, you know, about us as a society, if we do 
um, that practice. Um, it's not that it's neutral, but that it changes the conversation in a way where you might be able to bring you know, one or two other people onto your side. You know, if you're arguing for judges, you need to just br at least bring one more person to your side. Um, if you're on the Supreme Court, you need to get the five votes, right? If you're, if you're here in Seattle, you know, maybe you're addressed to a mayor or a governor's office or uh, the attorney general. These are all positions of authority. Um, uh, people who think about equality on an everyday basis and have tremendous power to block unjust laws, uh, refuse to enforce them, uh, veto them. Uh, so, so I think you know I think that it's it's a matter of finding an argument that will that will work. But let me just say one other thing in response to to the way you presented it, which is that um, I do like the idea of of, of bridging in some way um, because. Um, you're right that there's a lot of good social science data that I think confirms um, my concern right. that if what you're trying to do is to come up with a beautiful worldview and then get people to buy into it, that's usually a losing battle. At least it's going to take a long time right, to get people to come in for the very reasons you described, that we tend to lead very fractured lives. People get their news sources in different places. They have different backgrounds religiously. Uh, and, and so forth, right? Um, and so to get people to really buy into your priors is really a tough thing, okay? Um, so, so I just want to convince people that that's not the way to, to go about it, um, that you can achieve equality by just trying to find the conversation that will, uh, that will get someone to listen to you just long enough to reduce the pain that, that someone is experiencing. Other questions? Speaking of students, really quick again, since we're going to welcome you back to Fort Townsend as talk to students, <laughs> what, what, I'm looking forward to that. I've already heard. I'm, yeah, well, it's important because these are, this is the generation we have to get fired up, right? And, yeah. and we've got to not and get them to care. So, what what stories? I mean, I've heard some of them here tonight, but in what cases do you think can get them sort of indignant and, and upset enough to become activists? That's what I want you to do yeah. in Fort Townsend. Sure. Uh, that's right, that's right. That's right. <laughs> You know, so I, I, I teach um, I teach a, a, a stop and seizure case. I stop like cops and stops uh, in the law school, and that tends to get students fired up. And so, so I actually think you can't talk enough about racial, ju uh, like criminal justice right. issues. And uh, one part of the book, there's a chapter where I talk about uh, stop and frisk. And because as a young person, especially if you're a young male uh, living in an mm -hmm. urban place, especially mm -hmm. if you're a young mm -hmm. African American or Hispanic mm -hmm. male in New York City, for mm -hmm. example, right? Um, it turns out that you will have experienced stop and frisk in a very visceral way, mm. or if you are related to someone that I just mm. described, right? Um, and um, so there's a part of, the, uh, of one of the chapters where I, I talk about the lawsuit against the NYPD's practice of stop and frisking. And, once they, and this is the beautiful thing about lawsuits is that once you have su are suing somebody, you can get them in the deposition chair, and they're under oath. You, you, you get them to, to confirm confess, to say things that they wouldn't otherwise have admitted. <laughs> and in the in course of this litigation, they had the um, high-ranking uh, police official uh, in the deposition chair and it got him to admit that, yes, in fact, while the, all the policies were neutral, right, they were instructed essentially to stop uh, uh, young black males or Hispanic males between the ages of like 18 or tw to 26 or something. Now, then they were asked, well, why are you doing this? Right. Okay, so they had some pseudoscience in mind. They thought that <laughs> If they put all their resources to, uh, to that demographic group, that that was the most likely to be criminal, right? That they were going to find guns and they're going to find um, drugs. Well, what's interesting is that the lawsuit showed us that that wasn't true. That those assumptions were racist assumptions that were that didn't bear out. That in fact, even though they put all their attention there, their their hit rate, meaning how often did they find mm -hmm. drugs or a gun, was terrible. It was, was awful. It was worse than if they had just randomly stopped people. Yeah. Okay? So that, yeah. just sh that just shows you how off those, those racist assumptions were. So that would be one story I would tell. And the lawsuit ends up convincing, and that data mm -hmm. ends up convincing the judge to put an end to that, uh, that practice. And um, uh, so that would be one of the stories that hopefully uh, students will keep in mind. Um, I was just thinking about the Sacramento case that was just um, settled and it seems to me that anytime there's a case like that it's very easy or it's almost inevitable that the police will always be able to say I felt threatened and so the shooting was legitimate and um, 
and there seems to be no way around that even but there's the question of there's always the bias of the police in the culture or time and place where they are um, at that split second when they make the decision and that how is that fairness versus equality yeah. and how would you like ration that out because it seems like there's no other way around keeping that always happening where there's a shooting and nobody's held accountable whether it was overt bias or not you know yeah, that's so. Police shooting situations and and bias in in terms of the use of deadly force are some of the the hardest questions that uh, one can wrestle with. I mean, I think judges and juries have trouble with that. Prose prosecutors have trouble with that in deciding uh, when when to uh, charge an officer, right? Uh, and of course, as we know, that traditionally officers get quite a bit of the benefit of the doubt, uh, even when the facts don't look that good. Um, but um, so you know, we, I think we can talk about reforms, and, but I think a lot of that would have to happen to the front end. There's a lot of um, good work that people who think about this every day have been doing that talk about uh, where, you know, where officers live relative to where they patrol and um, where the officers that don't come from that particular community but are asked to police a particular community. That can sometimes raise this... Um, uh, a kind of a, a you know a different kind of a mindset, maybe even a willingness to use deadly force, um, and, and you know, and not see the population in the same way as if they were living among the the people that they're policing. I, I actually find that that's very interesting and, and useful. Uh, I also think that you have questions about the militarization of the police, which um, creates a kind of a mindset as well that's that's troubling. Um, and of course, training is something and you know, background checking and who, you know, who do we accept as good enough and smart enough and wise enough to be able to carry guns and, you know, interact with, with our children and so forth. I think those are all best answered kind of in this early point. But I do have a couple of situations in the book. I mean, one where um, there was a shooting, a deadly shooting, and um, a young uh, African male, uh, a teenager, was seen um, like kind of around the house, um, but he was not armed and he's running away and the police officer sh uh, shoots him in the back of the head and kills him. Uh, and the officer is later sued and the department is sued and so forth. And, you know, the argument is that um, he, was, he was dangerous. And what's interesting about that case is that the judges um, end up saying that there wasn't enough factual information there. It was not reasonable for the officer to use deadly force in that situation. The kid is running away. He's obviously not armed. He's starting to climb a fence. The officer shoots him in the back of the head. Um, and that's something that can be done well after the fact, but it doesn't bring the kid's life back, right? Mm -hmm. um, it does um, send a message, which is that um, before someone uses deadly force, they really ought to look for something objective, um, an objective threat uh, to life. One of the things that the state argued in that case was that, that officers should be freely um, able to use whatever discretion to use deadly force um, as they felt necessary to stop any crime. And, if, and I went back and, and, and watched and re-listened to the oral argument in that case, and it's really quite interesting. shocked me for the attorney general of the state uh, to stand up and say, um, I want my officers in this state to be able to, st to stop any crime with deadly force if the officer chose. And the j their justices who are skeptical, you mean like any crime? Like even like a, like a small property crime, a small, like a, a nothing kind of a crime? You want your officer to be able to use deadly force to stop that? And the lawyer says, yes. And I think that turned, that turned the case because that was like there's no standards at all. There's nothing that, you know, even um, can constrain the officer. And that was just a bridge too far for them. But, um, but again, that's, that's well after the fact. I think like if you really are worried about making progress there, you've got you to find ways to, to, to rethink how we, uh, how we police. OK. So the lady asked about uh, the cops using deadly force. And the prosecutor had said that they wanted to be able to use deadly force to stop any crime. Whereas, like, 
I had always thought that cops could not use deadly force unless they were endangered. Yeah, so that's generally how we think about it, and it's certainly how uh, policies are written. Um, but once this, once this case got to the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, it became a question of whether uh, the Constitution had anything to say about the use of deadly force. And, and it's at that point that the lawyers for the state uh, tried to argue that the Constitution has, has nothing to say about it, and it's um, kind of either up to the discretion of officers or each state to decide how it wants to handle uh, the police shooting situation. So the, 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 you know, the kind of conversation we had just now was very interesting because uh, sometimes lawyers, particularly representing a state, uh, they have a vested interest in protecting as much discretion um, uh, in police as they, as they can, but it's not always a good thing, right? Sometimes uh, it can be helpful if they get a little additional assistance from judges who can remind them, as they did in this case, that um, you know, having some standards from outside uh, can really promote better uh, kind of assessment of risk, um, and that if you just leave things completely up to police departments, right, you're going to have this sort of haphazard situation where some police departments might do the right training uh, about when to use deadly force, and others might not do it at all. Uh, and that's really the situation I think that's intolerable uh, and ended up being uh, this, the, the situation that the, the justices weren't willing to countenance. Mm -hmm. And you know, in the state of Washington, the police has to have malintent. They have to prove that he had malintent, which makes it impossible to uh, nail any police for shooting somebody. Mm. Yeah, so, so if, that's, if that's the case, then and, and, and a prosecutor would have to show some sort of malice um, then that's, as you say, that's pretty, that's pretty tough uh, to meet because uh, it's not like you can get into the mind of the officer. So all the, a prosecutor really has uh, to work with is kind of the severity of the, of the shooting. So, for example, you know, if you have a situation where the officer like empties, empties his gun into somebody uh, and that there's some other way of telling whether the, 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 the dead person um, actually posed a risk, let's say, uh, like the, the gentleman I just talked about, Garner, who, who turned, his, um, turned his head away, if there's any evidence of that, then maybe you can try to patch together a situation where the officer really isn't at risk, and then maybe they had some kind of encounter that went bad, you know, or, or, or they had previous dealings or something, but it's, it's, a, it's a very hard thing to show, as you suggest. Yeah, well, you know, the cops always empty their guns. You know, like the case of uh, Ahmed Diallo, mm -hmm. you know, he had a wallet, he didn't have a gun, but they still uh, emptied their guns. And uh, I heard, I don't know if this is true, but you know, they want to kill you because otherwise they're going to have to pay for your care for the rest of your life. Well, um, I've, heard, I've heard that as well. Um, you know, I, I think that when we see the severity of shootings like that, you know, what, what they often try to argue is that they're trained uh, to shoot that way. Uh, that if they feel a threat, um, even if it turns out not to be a threat, um, you know, they're trained to sort of um, sh shoot until they think that the threat is, is over. Um, but uh, again, that, that raises a kind of a training situation. Is that really um, how we want officers to be, you know, tr you know tr treating uh, civilians, um, and, um, and you know that's an awful situation where you can just think, you know, there's so many other ways maybe that could have been handled. Uh, you know, anytime you have a situation where multiple officers are converging on somebody, you know, you already think there's a it could be a recipe for disaster. Um, then they have their guns drawn, and um, uh, it just takes one person being a little bit freaked out for everyone to start firing. Yeah, do you feel? From your perspective, uh, do you see that this is moving in a positive direction? It's, it's hard to say. I mean, I think that the only positive thing I can detect right now is, is there much more awareness uh, among the public about how frequently uh, these kinds of things happen. Um, there's much more activism um, it, um, among young people, for example, um, around these kinds of issues. 
Um, and, it, and I think that is a positive thing uh, because it will take public pressure, not just lawsuits, uh, to really get um, enough members of the community to really want to um, do something about, about um, the overuse of force. Um, so um, that's what I take from it. I can't really say whether that has gotten any better overall. Okay. So then the other question was on uh, the rights of children. And, you know, we, this last week, this video went viral of all these children confronting Diane Feinstein mm. and all of her arrogance, you know, the way that she dealt with them. And this children's movement... This is about the climate change thing, right? Yeah, this, okay. this started happening here in the state of Washington, yeah. but it spread to other states like... Um, the children had a lawsuit against the governor and the Department of Ecology, you know, for not doing enough about climate change. Mm -hmm. And it is an equity issue because by the time that they grow up, it'll be all over. They have no future. And that's their argument. And, you know, this is, they're also suing the state of Washington now. Yeah, and you know, there's... It ha hasn't gone very far. I don't think it's gotten yeah. to any Supreme Courts or anything yet, but... So there's a, there's a fine tradition in this country of, of children really making a difference in activism, right? I mean, it, the civil rights movement involved, uh, at many important moments, children being, on the front, being willing to be on the front lines and actually um, including being willing to subject themselves to all kinds of uh, abuse uh, uh, to try to fur further uh, equality and other kinds of rights. And I think that that's what we're seeing a little bit of, of now, that sort of invocation of that tradition. Um, whether it's climate change, whether it's uh, gun reform, uh, reform of gun laws, um, you're, you're seeing young people kind of take the lead. And it's been very powerful to see these children sort of call out the adults and say, you know, you've had the chance to solve these problems or at least make headway and you just have wasted your time. And it, I, I think that that has always been a very powerful uh, thing for children to, uh, to, to do. And um, who knows what happens to the children when they get older, whether they're going to still hold those views. But at the moment, you see all these impassioned uh, young people. And I think that's, um, that's one reason to, to be hopeful. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful.